All right, I need you to open up your books to a blank piece of paper where you can take some notes. Open up your books to a blank piece of paper where you can take some notes. Have a seat. Seat. <laughs> Okay, we are opening up our books to a blank piece of paper. At the top of it, you're going to put today's date, which is the 9th. And if you're having a bout of deja vu at this moment, it's because we did it this morning. Uh, but we're going to do it again. November 9th. To the right of that, I want you to put bus tour. Bus tour. And I want your three aha moments from the bus tour. Aha moments, things that jumped out at you, uh, things that you knew but maybe had forgotten, uh, things that you had remembered but forgot the importance of. Three things. Three things. You guys are late. You're not allowed back in. <laughs> and I'm going to need some mic runners, please. Cordell. Dana. Are we on at home, Dan? Hi, everybody at home. Can you guys turn and wave to the people at home and say hello? Say we're back. Did they miss a good bus tour today? Yes. Yeah. yeah, see, you guys should have been here. I tell you what. Okay, three things. <laughs> Got one? Carolyn. Mic runners. Chop, chop. Okay, now again, I want to remind you, you should have your own three. Those of you who haven't written anything yet, because you thought you'd wait until the mic runners came and you just cheat. <laughs> okay, we're looking for retention here. So, uh, below your three, four, five, and six, take notes on the rest. Go ahead, Carolyn. I learned that just because I might not necessarily want that property, there might be an, a buyer for it. Um, that second house that we looked at was in such disrepair that I couldn't see funding it or having anything to do with it. But on the other hand, there were many people there that wanted to jump on it because they thought it was a great opportunity. Okay. And so you can't prejudge what you know, the market might be. Okay, you can't prejudge what the market might be, but you also have to identify where your comfort level lies from a lending standpoint. Okay? Because even for us as a lender, the answer is never no. It's this is our comfort level. Yeah. So what was the purchase price on the first house? Or the, the house you're speaking about. What was the price? I don't remember. 290. Yeah. Okay. Is that right? 290? The, the second house you're talking about, right? Yes. She's talking about the second house. What was the purchase price on the second house? 292. Okay. What is it worth fixed up? 360 fixed up. Okay. So, Carolyn, if I came to you and said, Carolyn, I want you to lend me 292 on that house, would you lend me 292? No. What would you lend me? 150. 150. So you're not telling me no. That's true. You're saying this is where I'm comfortable. Yeah. Remember yesterday we said that private money has no set pricing or parameters. And as an individual, you choose. So you never want to get into a habit as a lender of saying, I'm not going to lend that. I'm not going to fund that thing. Because there is a comfort level that you will get to where you will lend it. Right? Okay? So you just got to find out where your comfort level is and then go from there. Yes, Kenny. Uh, one thing I relearned is the best and highest use for a property. Okay, good. Highest and best use. Uh, tell me about the property that you looked at that had a higher and better use. Uh, probably the last one. It was listed as three bedrooms, two baths on one sheet, seven bedrooms, seven baths on another. Okay. And I think what the final determination was is 
it could be a maximum of five bedrooms, five baths in that neighborhood. It could be a max of five, five because of zoning? Yeah. It was zoned R2. It was zoned R2? They split What was it, like a rooming house? Okay. Were they using it for like elderly care? That was their intention? Uh, okay. Looked like it? Was there a ramp? Okay. Then it wasn't elderly care. The city would not allow what? Okay. 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 So the city wasn't going to allow the density use within the property. Uh, and that's pretty common because of parking. That's why elderly care typically works in that capacity because normally they have to be transported via a van or a public utility service. Um, so that would be a, an acceptable use. But again, the city, they decide. But what's great about cities, especially when they're broke, is you can pay them to pretty much let you do anything. Uh, you just have to figure out, is that money worth the return? Good. OK, over here. Yes, sir. On the uh, first property we looked at, what was neat to learn was the absorption rate. There was only two weeks of inventory in the area. So you don't necessarily have to put 100 things of the fix in there. You can do some cosmetic things. and. Uh, it should still sell pretty fast. Okay, good. The absorption rate's two weeks, so there's not a lot of inventory and there's a lot of buyers. Would you guys believe that in most markets you can find a particular area of town that has absorption rates less than 30 days? And that's true in Michigan, that's true in Ohio, that's true in most markets. So you have to identify what is the predominant uh, desire in that particular marketplace. And if you want to move property quickly, that's where you shop, that's where you sell. But know that if you're playing in a low inventory area, your margins are going to be thin. Okay? So what you, get, what you get in the form of speed of turn, you lose in margin. Because there's so many people there that are bidding on the same property, you've got to bid higher. So if you outbid the competitor by 1000 bucks, you may be sitting at 220 on a house you can only sell for 240 So after costs and everything else, you might clear seven, but you do it in 30 days. So if you can make 7,000 a month with the same 220 grand, what's your yield? So take 7,000 times 12. How much is that? It's 84,000, right? 84,000 divided by 220. What is that? 30% roughly, and you're doing it on slim margins. So remember yesterday when I said you as a fund, you need to identify what your target yield is? The reason for that is when you know what your target yield is, you can better determine what investment vehicles you should be pursuing. So if your target yield is 25 or better, you need quick turn, low margin product because that's the stuff you get in and out of very quickly. If you're looking for lower returns but greater income streams, then you pursue bigger margins with longer turn times but you determine what strategy am I going to pursue. And I see so many investors that struggle with this because all they're looking for is a good deal. Well, that is such a big shopping center of opportunity that it's hard to narrow in on what it is you really want. Uh, I consider myself to be a marketing guy, as you know. And one of the things I do as a marketer is I identify who is my perfect target customer. Who are they? And I, I make them my poster child for the marketing message. Who are they? What do they like? What is their income? Where do they assemble together? What magazines do they subscribe to so I can buy a mailing list of just that person? And as investors, you should be doing that in real estate as well. But you guys are going after little shabby single family homes. You're pursuing four plexes, eight plexes, 200 unit complexes. You're shopping note deals. You're trying to do short-term transactional funding. You're affiliates for a lending company. And if you're confused about what your core competency is, guess who else is? Your customer. Your customer is going, what do you do? Right? You're like the handyman. You've got a tool for everything. But you're still only making 12 bucks an hour. 
So if you want to get rich quickly, you must niche. The old adage of there's riches in niches. Mm -hmm. So pick your niche and be the best at it. And your income will skyrocket. Bill. Yes, sir. Bill. Um, OK. Um, my takeaway moment was the diamond in the rough. That was the second house we looked at, I believe. And uh, it was rough. But by the time Reagan explained it all, there was money to be made there, definitely. So are you going to buy it? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, I got 100 bucks here for you. Do you want it? No? Okay. <laughs> Why aren't you going to buy it, Bill? Um, well, I don't live here. I don't have a rehab crew here. I don't know anyone here. And I hate houses. I'm here to learn how to run a crew, tell the crew what to do, but I strictly want to lend money. I have made you such a snob. So I have to, <laughs> I have to buy houses in order to lend more money. <laughs> so uh, who, who's a local here that, why am I getting this weird rumbling feedback? <laughs> Could we have Don escorted off property, please? Don, Don is trapped in the eighth grade, apparently. Because <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, that's what it was. Who's local? I'm pretty sure nobody wants to work with Don at this point. You know, maybe tomorrow after some Beano or something. Uh, okay, who's local? Let me see your hands. And who would be willing to partner with Bill on overseeing the rehab of that project and splitting the profit if he put up all the money? <laughs> hey, Bill, you may be stepping over dollars to pick up nickels, my friend, because there's all kinds of people that will do exactly what you want to do, which is run crews or lend. So let's take it to the next level now. Who in the room would buy that property if they had access to the capital to do it? Okay, Bill, so you got now a bunch of people, you got a bunch of investors that want to borrow money from you. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so that said, how many of you got with Judith and wrote an offer while on the bus or told Judith, I want to put an offer on that property? No. What, did you write it? Okay, have you written it? Oh, she went to the other bus. You know what she did? She said, what are you willing to pay? And she went to the other bus. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, hey, I got a buyer, right? That's good, Judith. I like that. Uh, by the way, can we give Judith a round of applause for all she did? <laughs> Thank you, Judith. And Leah, we owe Judith money. Make sure we give Judith money. You got it? OK, good. Yeah, Judith put together all flyers and put the whole tour together. So thank you, Judith. We really appreciate that. Uh, what else? Yes, Raphael. How did you know my name? It's on your name tag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one thing that, uh, especially after listening to people, it really drove home that in hearing people over there, like her, re I, was, I think it was Carol's reaction about I will never buy that house, is that ugly really does mean lots of money. Not just money, but lots of money if you just start thinking differently. Start thinking differently. Good. Yeah. And, and I mean, it drove it home for me. I mean, I believe that already, but this time it really anchored it. This one yeah. way of putting it. Yeah. In real estate, unlike in marriage, it's easy to love ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Ooh. good grief. <laughs> hey, Dory, no tomatoes for dinner tomorrow night. You guys are rough. My goodness gracious. All right, where are we at over here, Dana? Just hand it to somebody. Nobody Put them on the spot. Nobody, uh... Kathy. Um, I, you know, it, sound, it wasn't aha. It was like, no, duh. That second house, I mean, it was just so ugly. I was just like, no, whatever. But it doesn't. Just because they're asking 292 doesn't mean I have to offer 292. Ah, there you go. Okay, good. If you didn't write that down, you should. And even if you think you knew that, write it down anyway. 
Um, the listed price is not the required offer price. Okay? Now, if you don't know what you should offer on such a property, what's the answer? 50%. Now, here's where you've got to be careful about pinpointing your target properties. Okay? Let me, let me, let me explain. Judith, they're asking 292 for the property. I would like to offer 141. 146. You gonna let me offer that? Okay. So this is a realtor who gets it. Any other realtors in the room? Okay. Zen, do you think that 142 or 146 hours is gonna get accepted? No. Are you gonna write it anyway? Yes or no? So we're right back to where we started. <laughs> okay, you'd write it. All right. Now, what I have encountered with some clients is your presentation. And I'm not going to cover that tonight. I'm going to cover that tomorrow. But your presentation is everything. Because do you tell your agent what to write the offer for with conviction? And when they say, where are you going to get the money? You say, I got the money covered. You just do your job. I got this. You do your job. Or do you speak in a sheepish, somewhat questionable, suggestive, well, what do you think? Okay, realtors only get paid when you buy real estate. And if you don't come off that you are a serious buyer that's going to perform as promised, they're not getting paid. So they're not going to write the offer for you. But if you pursue unlisted property, then you don't need an agent to write an offer. Okay? If the property's on the MLS, you've got to write an offer through an agent. They just will not work with you unless you have representation. Now, it's illegal in California to be a, a, a co-broker, isn't it? You can still represent the buyer and the seller yeah. Yeah. as long as it's disclosed. Yeah. Okay, so dual agency. Should you ever allow an agent to represent you as a dual agent? No. No. They don't have your best interest in heart because they know both sides. But I'm not going to get into the details. Anyway, where are we at? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, I did notice that on the first property that it was a little pocket. It was brought out that it was a, little, a nice pocket in a otherwise a medium neighborhood. It was a little more high-end um, street, a couple of street area. And that would be a benefit if other people didn't realize that. So the property was subpar for the neighborhood? No, it was nicer. Oh, it was nicer than it was the neighborhood? It was nicer than the neighborhood. Is that good or bad? Good. Well, the, the, you could offer less. If okay. the comps were lower, you could bring down the, make a lower offer because okay. the comps were around it were lower. It yeah. was a pocket, pocket of nicer, nicer houses. houses? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, just make sure that there are supportive comps surrounding it yeah. so that you don't have to go too far from the subject property to establish value. Because uh -huh. when you look at an appraisal and they're, they're bringing you value from 10 miles away, and I know that's extreme, but when I look at an appraisal and the best comp is three and a half miles away, did you guys notice how quickly a community will change colors on you? Yes. One minute it's like, wow, this is beautiful, and the next minute you're like hoping you don't get shot, right? <laughs> that happens a lot yeah. in a lot of places. Yeah. So you got to be real cautious about comps being yeah. too far away. Well, I meant you can use low, the lower comps to justify the lower yeah. price. Yes, it, yes, certainly. So you can kind of play both sides. Yeah. When you're buying, you use the worst comps you can find. When you're selling, you show them the best. Yeah. Yeah, good. Where are you at, Cordell? You just got to start putting people on the spot. I've already done mine. Oh, he did his. Yep. Um, the different views of what needed to be done on each house. Okay. Like what? Well, I mean, you know, we were talking electrical in the first house. One was complete rewire, and the other was, okay, I might just do one or two outlets. I'm just kind of going through in that same sense. So, um, I mean, that was, I, I think, from a standpoint of the whole group, was everybody had a little bit different idea of what they would do. Um, and the bottom line of the first one was, it was pretty much a lipstick deal with the exception of the bathroom. Okay. Okay. What did you think it needed? 
Um, I was pretty much with the with the lipstick and the uh, you know the one bathroom we definitely noticed um, an older house. I noticed some settling. What, you know, went and looked. It didn't see. I mean, I saw a little bit of issues with the wiring, which would require. Um, but uh, new countertops in the kitchen. Nothing really. Just a lot of paint. Okay. Uh, just be cautious. The one thing you got to be cautious of regarding cosmetics is that you're not putting lipstick on a pig, right? Oh, absolutely. Because I mean, the, the buyer sees it. So you make the front yard look really good, and by the end of it, you have exited the rear, and you have no interest. Uh, so you've got to carry it throughout. There's certainly things you can do to reduce or limit costs outlay, uh, but there are some things that you cannot shortcut. Good. Okay, what else? Okay. Um, one of my ahas is I'm a rehabber, contractor. I like to pick out everything. As an investor, I'm going to quit doing that. <laughs> I can overlook a bunch of it, but I like to pick out everything. Yeah. So I get a little too technical when I do not need to. Yeah. A little paint instead of tearing the sheetrock down and redoing it. Yeah, and that's okay. tough to do because as a contractor, the more work you bid out, the more money you make. Exactly. As an investor, the more work you bid out, the less profit you make. Yeah, so that's a hard line to cross. I have a brother-in-law that's a builder, and I hired him to uh, rehab a property for me. And he, he, he's a new home guy. So I went through the property, which is only like 800 square feet, and I said, okay, well, this thing should run about eight grand. And six weeks later, I got a bill for $38,000. And I went, this, this, this is my house? I don't think so. Needless to say, he's never worked for me again. Family and business, you know. Mm, yeah. Okay, one last one. Where are we at? Okay, last one, Dale. This better be good. Well, it comes from Regan, so it's got to be great. Well, we'll all be the judge of well, that. Okay. <laughs> uh, one thing that he kept driving home at each of the um, houses that we looked at was reeling in what the market would demand in the way of rehab. I think previously I would go into a property and I'd look around and see everything that needed to be done. And he disabused me of that idea in this kind of a market in Orange County. It's like the uh, absorption rate is so high right now. You don't have to do all that stuff. People will take a house that's still a little ugly just in order to get it. And so you don't have to invest all that you thought you might in a rehab. Okay, good. Uh, take that a step further though. In a market where the absorption rate is two weeks and the inventory is so limited, do you actually ever have to buy the property? Or can you just write it under contract, control it through contract, set up a 45 day escrow and wholesale it to somebody else? And then just make 10 in the middle? Yeah, okay. The cost of money will eat you alive. So any time you can avoid borrowing money to get the deal done, that's what you should do. So if you control it with the contract, market it within the confines of the contract, then roll it off, now you don't incur the cost of money, which means you make a greater profit and you can offer it at a lower price. So it's the back to the Elmo analogy I gave you this morning. Or do you guys remember the silly thing, the Beanie Babies? Was that not like the dumbest thing you've ever seen? And I, I, I mean no disrespect if you've got a garage full of these things, okay? But I'm sure you're cats are there playing with them. That was funny to me, apparently. It did. <laughs> Beanie Babies, right? Uh, the grocery store that I was working at, this was like 17 years ago when Beanie Babies came out, and I remember that the grocery store was auctioning off the Queen Beanie. The Queen Beanie. Now, this thing costs like 50 cents to manufacture, and they sold it for $1,800 for charity. Now, charity helps the cause, right? But the fact that it was like the only one in the continental United States made its value go up exponentially. And the same is true with small inventory levels, okay? If there's very little inventory, then values go up rapidly, uh, especially in a two-week scenario. Uh, was it you, Zen, that was telling me that most properties that hit the market will have 38 offers within the day? Is that an accurate statement, Judith? Yeah. Yeah, okay. A lot. a lot, okay? So a lot of offers in a short period of time. So you get it under contract, 
and then go back to everybody that wrote an offer and say, hey, I control the contract, but you can buy it from me for 10, for 10 grand. Just give me 10,000 bucks and I'll give you the contract. Can you do that? Yeah. Is that legal? Yeah. Are you going to do it? Yeah. You promise? Yeah. All right, good. Okay, so you guys had a good day today? Yeah. Did you learn lots? Yeah. Okay, um, I had scheduled to teach you guys how to make seven figures in the next 90 days, but you look pretty tired. So maybe we'll just close and do it tomorrow. <laughs> okay, you want it you want it now? All right, all right. All right, all right. Okay, but he, here are the terms. Here are the terms. I will do it now, but you must be attentive. You must take notes, and if I see you sleeping or dozing off, that is a oral obligation or permission for me to come over and stump you on the head. I would never do it to a grandmother. I can't argue that. Either. Okay, turn in your books then to the entrepreneur's education. The entrepreneur's education. Hey, I found what I dropped. Yeah, that's, that was it. Okay, the entrepreneur's education. Typical education and why it's failing the entrepreneur. There are some things going on with some of you that are blocking you from really having the success that you're looking for. Uh, by the way, I've shared this before. I don't know if you guys have heard me say this before. Do you know who uh, puts together the educational curriculum in our high schools and our colleges? Do you know who does that? A company by the name of McGraw-Hill. You guys familiar with McGraw-Hill? Okay. Uh, McGraw-Hill provides all of the math books, textbooks for grade schools and elementaries around the country. Uh, do you guys recall in elementary, junior high, or high school being taught how to balance a checkbook? Okay. Do you recall in high school or college being told how to put together a good packaged portfolio to raise capital or to get money for a new business venture or opportunity? You don't remember that? Huh. And do you remember being taught anything about yield or return on investment? Okay, interesting. Do you know who owns McGraw-Hill? Bank of America. Interesting, isn't it? Bank of America owns the company that provides the textbooks for our schools that teach our kids. Which is why... We assemble in rooms such as these to learn the basic elements of rates of return and turn on investment, how to raise capital, how to package loans together. Why do you think that banks wouldn't want us to know this stuff? So they can take advantage of us. Do you have any idea how much money banks make on uh, bounced check fees? They make a fortune. I had, a, I, had a, I had a contact with a bank insider who said when uh, the Frank Dodd bill changed all the banking laws and regulations that their company's revenues dropped by a quarter million dollars a month because it limited how much they could charge customers for insufficient funds fees and defaulted check fees. So banks now are scrambling to figure out another way to generate the same income that they lost from taking advantage of uneducated consumers. Which is fascinating because who made us uneducated consumers? They did, right? So because of that, our grade school education is not going to get us there. We're taught at an early age to conform and follow the rules. You find out early that different is not good. And thinking outside the box is not rewarded while towing the line is applauded. Anybody ever uh, get taught by your folks to go to school, get a good education, and go get a good job? How's that working out? If you love your job, I don't know if you'd be here, right? Okay. High school, assimilate and learn basic information to earn your graduation degree so that you can go to what? 
Yes, I remember my guidance counselor coming in to me uh, after she had called me in to discuss my curriculum choices for that particular quarter of school. I had advanced bicycling, weight training, advanced volleyball, uh, what was the other one? Uh, I was the volleyball coach for the girls team. I was. Hey, what's better than being the only male on a bus full of 40 women? I thought that was pretty, pretty smart. Anyway, uh, English, math. That was it. Doesn't that sound like a great schedule? It was the best year ever. My guidance counselor brings me in and says, Lee, don't you want to go to college? I said, no. She says, why not? I said, because I don't want to go to college. But you go to college, you get a good job, and you, you make lots of money. I said, no, you don't. I said, I know people who went to college and have jobs, and they hate it. Now, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I didn't think I wanted to go to college, which is why I started a community college, and then I started buying real estate. So high school, I was not motivated in high school. Uh, college, given a limited amount of subject study, doesn't teach practical skills or real-world troubleshooting strategies for business and life. Now, what's interesting about college, I like hiring college graduates. I love employees with degrees, even though I don't have one. I dropped out of college my sophomore year. So why would you suppose that I like employees with college degrees? Why? Why? They're trainable, and they've proven to be able to do what? Set a goal, complete the task, and implement, right? Uh, it's the college-educated people in my office that are burning the midnight oil because a project is done by the next day. It's the uneducated or the non-college graduates that are like, hey, I'll do it tomorrow. Now, I am a college dropout, so who am I? I'll do it tomorrow. <gasps> but wait, I have employees with college degrees. I'm going to need that done by tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to need all of the staff to leave. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm anticipating a mass exodus out of my office on Monday. Does anybody need a job? No. no. Job. Pigeon holds you into one earning vertical. You're usually one voice in many, and you don't make any large decisions. Okay. Now the problem with a job is you get hired for specific task, a specific duty, and you get pigeonholed into that task or duty, and rarely do you have the opportunity to cross into other verticals within the company. So what can you do to be more effective or to grow within the company? Now I'm going to need everybody back there to plug your ears. Okay? Your job currently should do nothing more than leverage you into the next job. Seriously. I mean... Employers have this thing about, well, they were with me, and then they left, and then they left, and then they left. You know, i got to give a lot of credit to Regan, uh, because in 2005, Regan came to me. He had been with me a couple years. He was doing well. I was doing well because I was the broker of records. So every time he closed a loan, I got paid, which was great. But Regan came into my office one day. He said, Lee, you know, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but I need to now go to the next level. He says, I'm going to get my broker's license and I'm going to go work for a home builder and, and kind of build this out for him. And I say, you know what, Regan? Absolutely, I want you to do that. And I appreciate you coming to me and telling me before you did that. And I will only be offended if you go off and you make millions and you don't come back and give me the opportunity to get on board with whatever it is you're doing. Isn't that an interesting take on things? And I have had employee after employee come to me and tell me, hey, you know what, I'm going to the next level, I'm moving up, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I say, you know what, that's great. And wherever you land, if there's a way that we can make money together, I want you to call me. And I want to maintain the relationship. But we should never stunt growth, right? We should encourage growth because we should want everybody around us to be better, shouldn't we? We want them to make more money. But unfortunately, employers, they have this, this small mentality that if you leave here, the company's going to fall apart or you're not going to do as well. You know, so you need to provide an environment, especially as an, employ as an employer. You need to provide an environment where people can grow and flourish within your organization so that they see opportunity, so that they don't have to look at the company across the street 
to say, maybe if I go over there, I'll be valued, right? How many of you have employees? How many of you would like to have an employee? Okay. Let me give you a goal to leave here with. Within the next 90 days, I want everybody in this room to have a personal assistant. Seriously. Every single one of you in this room should have a personal assistant. I'm not kidding. Who's working on your business right now while you're here? No one. So not only do you incur the costs of travel to come here, the cost of hotel rooms and food to lodge here, but you also incur something that is much more damaging to your business. It's called opportunity cost. Okay? The cost of you being here is great because of all the opportunity you're missing out on. Because you're not mailing letters, you're not making phone calls, you're not writing offers, you're not buying real estate, are you? So what is it costing you to be here? So people will say, well, Lee, I can't afford an assistant. You know what? Don't pay the mortgage and pay an assistant. <gasps> you can't tell people that. That's horrible. No, I'm telling you that because it's that important. And I told my wife when we first met, I said, you know, uh, we're going to be rich, we're going to be poor. Be ready. I said, but when we are poor, I got bad news. I said, before we feed and or clothe the children, I will pay my assistant's salary. Because I believe that's how important it is to have an assistant. You've got to have somebody you can delegate these mundane, monotonous tasks to. They're incredibly important to your business. You must identify what your core competency is and then go out of your way to free up your schedule to just do that. Now, I believe that my core competence is communication, negotiation, and closing. So if somebody wants to have a meeting with me, they contact my assistant. And she schedules them in my calendar weeks out. And then she collects from them all of the things that we are going to talk about in that meeting and what we would like to accomplish as a result of being in that meeting. They come into my lobby, they wait there, where I have a three-minute loop DVD playing of me speaking, so they see me as authority figure, right? So the video's selling them. Then they are brought down into my office where they will wait another five minutes. And then I will come out, shake their hand, and say, hey, how you doing? Okay, I understand we wanted it. Da, 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 da. Okay, good. actually, you know, it sounds great. I'll let my attorney draft the agreements. We'll get them signed, and we'll start making some money together. What amount of time did I invest into the transaction? Like 10 minutes. Now, if I can close deals in 10 minutes, how many more deals can I close in a week? So what's the value of an assistant? So... You guys got to figure out how to free up some capital that you can afford some help. But now you bring yourself to another challenge that you will face. Managing people. And I don't have time to go into that today. And I have determined that I'm not really good at that. That's why Dean is the chief, op chief operations officer. Because he's much better at managing people than I am. Would you agree with that, Dean? Thanks, Dean. <laughs> All right, so what's really happening? Gains in critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills are either exceedingly small or non-existent for a larger proportion of students. 36% of students experience no significant improvement in learning as measured by the collegiate learning assessment during four years of higher education. I believe that that number is going to exponentially higher as more and more states legalize marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, in the last vote, they legalized marijuana in the state of Washington. So it, 10 years from now, if you're going into heart surgery and your doctor graduated from the University of Washington, flee the scene immediately. Okay? Because they are stoned. <laughs> yeah, what's going to happen to Windows? It's going to look a lot more like Apple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-huh. All right. Okay. I see where you guys are at. The education system not prepares for self-employment and entrepreneurship. Would you guys agree with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, we, don't, we aren't taught these things. We aren't taught basic business functions, starting companies, LLCs, payroll. Uh, there's a lot to it. Would you agree with that? 
a lot to it. And not, I'm, I don't even know it all. But here's the entrepreneur checklist. Okay, number one, you must have a clear and precise vision. Now, you guys are following along there in your slides. You should be. What is your clear and precise vision? Okay. In the next 12 months, what does your business look like that is different than what it looks like right now? What's your clear and precise vision? So, do you have an assistant? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Do you have assets? Yes. Do you have cash flow? Yes. Do you have future growing opportunity and expanding enterprise? Yes. Okay. So this is our clear and precise vision. Now, as we were putting together the Kogo facility in Spokane, and I will show you photos of that uh, tomorrow or the next day, uh, but as we were putting that together, uh, Dean and the executive team, we all got together, and I said, this is the vision that I have for this facility. And everybody kind of threw in what they had. And from those ideas, we put together a vision board. And we put in the color scheme, we put in the logo concept, we put in the furniture, the cubicles, everything. We were just Googling orange furniture and printing it off and putting it on this thing. And what's fascinating is when you walk into the Kogo Spokane facility, guess what it looks exactly like? Vision board. Okay. So what does your vision for your future consist of? And is it clearly defined? Do you know what it looks like? Think about it. Do you drive a nicer car? Do you live in a bigger home if those things are important to you? Did you finally get the plastic surgery so your wife can stand to look at you? <laughs> I'm horrible. All right, creatively persist through disappointments. Now, yesterday I made the comment to somebody. I said, you know what? If that bothers you, you should probably just get out of the business. So please write in your notes somewhere the word emotion. I want you to write emotion. And directly below that, the sister of emotion, which is feelings. Emotion, feelings. And then I want you to put a big X through them because they have no place in business. Emotion and feelings have no place in business. The numbers either work or they don't work. The person you hired is either completing the tasks or they're not, period. There's no room for emotion. There's no room for feeling. They either are or they aren't. It's black and white. It's either a good investment opportunity or it's not. And if it's not, don't try to make it one. There's too many opportunities. That's what I love about entrepreneurship. There's no shortage of ways to make money. There are better ways than other ways, and some are more profitable than others, but you must decide. Remember yesterday we talked about time? You must determine what is the greatest investment of your time that's going to produce you the greatest return on investment of time. We talk a lot about what's your rate of return on that investment. I think of it, what's my rate of return on that investment in the form of time? So I may have made $10,000, but it took me a year to do it. Is that a better rate of return than a deal I made $5,000 on that took me 10 minutes to do it? You need to start thinking about your return on investment in turn of, in, in, from the standpoint of time. Okay? Money is important, but can we all agree that money is easily replaced? Yeah. Work smart. Plan for mistakes and failures. I don't believe in mistakes and failures. I believe in what Thomas Edison said is I found 2,000 ways that you cannot make a light bulb. Okay, so failure is not failure. It's a new way of determining how something doesn't work. Now, one of the advantages of having mentors that you work with and consultants as part of your business is they tell you what won't work. And I can tell you it's cheaper to pay them to tell you what won't work than to just figure it out yourself because stupidity is expensive. And I know that. Like Regan, I've lost a lot of money doing really stupid things, and I continue to. Perform. I talked earlier today about just being the person that does what they say they're going to do. If you say you'll be there at 4, be there at 4. Unless you have a license plate that says on time is when I get there, which makes it okay for you to be 15 minutes late. All right, work expeditiously with targeted dates, okay? 
Now, one of the things I always tell people when they tell me their plans and their dreams, and this is what I'm going to accomplish, and this is what I'm going to do, I say, great, by when? By when? So, you guys have a clear and precise vision for your future, right? By when? Now, Dean has done a great job in coming in. Uh, prior to Dean coming in, I did everything by the, by the week, right? Did we have a good week? Then we, did we have a good month? And Dean brought me back and he says, Lee, you've got to stop running the business by the week. You've got to run the business by the quarter. Because only in the quarter do you eliminate these hyper fluctuations and you see what's really going on. And that was good advice. But that has now prompted me to create quarterly objectives under Dean's guidance. So now when you walk into our office against the back wall of the sales area, all of the quarterly objectives for quarter four, I think there's 27 of them now, uh, so the entire team, you cannot come into our office without seeing the quarterly objectives. We need everybody to know what the goal is so that we are all working towards the same targeted outcome. And it's changed our business because everybody's focused. Focus is a cool thing. You know what's great about focus? You don't have to think. Subconsciously, focus will guide you to wherever you want to go. Okay? So you've got to get your team on board with you. Produce results that reflect a quality outcome. And I would like you to put next to that bullet, this does not mean cash or assets. Success is not defined by how much you've got or how much you spent or how much you own. Success is defined by are you happy? Are you happy? You know, we work so hard. To make so much that can be taken away in just a moment's notice. I'll tell you what, in 2007, I was a much different person. I was, I don't know if I'd say arrogant. I know people that knew me would say arrogant, right? Uh, things were going along great. I remember Regan and Justin being in our office when we got the tax assessor's notice and calculating the value of our property and how much more our net worth had gone up. And so now we're like, hey, my net worth's gone up $3 million. I'm like, my net worth's gone up $5 million. And I'm like, yeah, my net worth's gone up $10 million. 18 months later, we were all broke, right? So it's like, why was I sacrificing time away from family? Why was I sacrificing time with my kids? To grow what? So, so don't define success by stuff, right? Are you happy. That's number one. Attain true excellence through proper education, which is why you are here. Victor Kean, the owner of Remington Products, said this, entrepreneurs are risk takers willing to roll the dice with their money or reputation on the line in support of an idea or enterprise. They willingly assume responsibility for the success or failure of a venture and are answerable for all of its facets. Please write on your paper somewhere, it's IT apostrophe S. It's my, M-Y, fault, F-A-U-L-T. You'll never get rich blaming others. You'll never get rich blaming others. It's the responsibility formula. You guys know the responsibility formula? If you want more control over your time, your business, your relationships, your finances, you must take more responsibility. If you want less control or you feel like your life is out of control, it's because you're giving away the responsibility. Well, it wasn't my fault. It was that darned Obama. Right? Obama's one guy. You know, I like what George Bush said. He said, stop worrying about what's going on in the White House and start worrying about what's going on in your own house. Right? Stop blaming Obama. Right? The market's great. I love Obama. And I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm actually a very conservative Democrat and I'm a liberal Republican. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> but think about it. This is the best time in history to be buying real estate. You can buy property cheaper now than you could ever, even after the Great Depression. Great Depression, we got the Great Recession. Are you kidding me? These are the stories we're going to be sitting around when we're old telling our grandkids. Back when I was a young boy, 
I look, I'm a cute old guy, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, moving on. All right. What mental blocks are holding you back? You are your worst enemy. Learn to overcome the common mental stumbling blocks and move on. Mental stumbling blocks, I'm not smart enough. I don't have the experience. I don't believe I can handle the responsibility. Or I'm too afraid of possible failure to try. Now, admittedly, I struggle with these because I am a college dropout. And not even like a Yale or a Harvard dropout like Steve Jobs was or uh, who's the Microsoft guy? Bill Gates, okay? Bill Gates dropped out of Harvard. I think it was Harvard. And then Steve Jobs dropped out of Yale, I think. No, both Stanford. That's what it was. I dropped out of Spokane Falls Community College. <laughs> Yay, me, right? So seriously, when I get in the room with these, acade these academic people with the PhDs and the degrees and all these things, I start feeling a little inadequate. But then I stop myself and go, wait a minute. They flew across the country to be here, and they're sitting in my conference room. So give me back my Rolo. <laughs> it's my Rolo. By the way, I really like Rolos, and my birthday is coming up in March, so just, just putting it out there. Why we work for others. We're trained at a very young age to work for someone else. I got trained when I was four. On a Saturday morning when my grandparents were staying over at the house, I had to go all the way to the end of the driveway and get the newspaper <laughs> and bring it back to my grandfather, who proceeded to pay me two bits. Now, when you're four, that sounds like a significant sum of money. Does anybody know what two bits is? It's 25 cents. Two bits, you cheapskate. That's a long ways. That's like 40 feet. It's worth like 39 cents. We didn't negotiate, though. So we're taught to work at a young age, aren't we? We're used to taking direction, not giving it. Regular paycheck feels safe. We need to work for retirement. We need a job for medical insurance. Essentially, we would rather work 9 to 5 at something we hate than work 7 to 10 at something we love. Or at least we think. Now, i got to give those of you who are married, you have mortgages, you have car payments, you have insurance, you've got kids, you've got grandkids, and you're here making a go of this thing. Because i got to tell you, I started buying and selling real estate when I was 18 years old. I was making $3.90 an hour. So my check consisted of $138, with which I would put gas in my car, pay the car payment, buy Cheetos and Peach Snapple. Oh, it's delicious. Are you kidding me? The flavors blend together. Oh, my goodness, it's phenomenal. Cheetos and peach Snapple. Trust me on this. It's delicious, okay? So I didn't have the same responsibilities. I didn't have all that stuff. But in building from there and now looking back on you guys, I was talking with Aswad, right? last night, and he says, Lee, I, 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 I want to quit my job, and I want to do this full time. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Do not quit your job until we have better positioned your portfolio and your income stream. Because if he quits his job now, he's not going to be able to get bank financing. He can't get mortgages. There's a lot of things he will not be able to do without having a job. So I understand that you all want to quit your jobs and do this full time, but there is a process through which you need to do it. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, you need to quit right now and just do this full time, because I think that's irresponsible. I believe there's a, a responsible way to do it where you can build upon a foundation and grow. I love that story about the donkey in the well. You heard the story? Townspeople kept throwing manure on the donkey in the well. What did the donkey do? He stepped on the manure. And they kept pouring more up. So eventually, he stepped on so much manure, he jumped out of the well, and he went on to freedom. Right now, you are the donkey in the well if you are employed and you hate your job. Because you got everybody at your work dumping garbage on you, you're taking on heaps of stuff you don't want to deal with, but you got to keep stepping on top of it. Keep climbing up out of that hole. How do you climb up out of that hole as an entrepreneur? You start better managing your money. You start setting monies aside. You, stop, you start foregoing niceties that you'd like to have now 
so that you can use that money for investment purposes and put it into something that gives you a rate of return. My cousin is a diesel mechanic. Hates his job. Diesel mechanic, hates his job. And he continually comes to me and says, Lee, what do I got to do to get out of the rat race? I said, you need to start investing your money more wisely. You need to put it into some investment opportunities. Well, how do I do that? I said, well, look, here's REO properties, here's short sales, here's a list of out-of-state owners you can start working. I want you to mail letters and I want you to make phone calls. Okay, I'm going to do it. Guess how many letters he wrote? Zero. Guess how many phone calls he made? None. He proceeds to tell me after he receives his tax return, the check that you get from the government every year as an employee, he said, Lee, I just got $6,800. What should I do with it? I said, that's good seed capital. I want you to put it in the bank. We're going to find an opportunity. And we're going to put that money into the opportunity, and it's going to reap dividends. Oh, Lee, that sounds great. Next Friday, I'm at his house, sitting at his new kitchen table, watching his new big screen TV, <laughs> eating ribeye steak, which I really appreciated. That was delicious. Okay? You've got to forego the niceties now to get what you want later. And it's really hard, you know. You start doing well, you get the promotion at the office, you're making more money, things are going great, so you go buy more stuff. Now, you can either keep up with the Joneses or you can be the Joneses, right? Now, I want to live in Warren Buffett's neighborhood because if he's the Joneses, I'm doing okay, right? He lives in a little 2,600 square foot house and he drives a 1956 Ford truck. And he's worth $56 billion. And I'm guessing that the majority of you in here have a nicer house and a nicer car. Anybody have $56 billion? Let's see that, because that would really be helpful for our funding business. <laughs> <laughs> Medical insurance, we had a woman apply uh, just Wednesday, and um, she has 30 years in the escrow business, 30 years in the escrow business, and she was making pretty good money. It was her company. She sold it, and she was working there, uh, and she, she, she decided she was going to be done with that, and she was coming to work for us, and when the interview, we told her what the position was paying, and she says, well, that's about a third of what I normally make. We said, well, we don't offer it to you to be offensive. We, that's what we, the position pays. She says, well, tell me about your medical benefits. And I went, well, they're good. She said, I'll take it. Okay, so now she's beholden to the benefits. As an entrepreneur, you should have the luxury of being able to choose where you go, who you go with, what you make, when you make it, how you make it, who you give to charities with. You should have that capacity and that ability to do that. If you don't, do you have a business? And until you get an assistant that's doing the work for you in your absence, you still don't own a business. You own a job. So why self-employment is safer? Well, I have lots of freedom to explore all income outlets at all hours of the day. I'm not pigeonholed in. One job description, one set of hours, working certain days of the week, one genre or type of work. As an entrepreneur, you get to pick which 12 hours in a day you're going to work. Because you will work 12 hours a day. I work a minimum of 12 hours a day. Is that what you guys want? What's your favorite thing to do, Carolyn? Bead. Bead. How much time would you spend beading if you could make millions of dollars beading? You'd hire people to do it for you, but you'd probably do it and love it, right? How many of you love what you do right now? Okay. Are you making millions at it? Close. We're getting there. Okay. The rest of you are not raising your hand. Why? Why don't you love what you're doing? I don't mind working 12 hours a day because I really love what I do. I think it's a lot of fun. We get to work with people. We get to help people. We get to watch people grow. We get to watch people earn revenue. We lend them money on deals that we train them how to find and acquire, and because of that, they're pocketing twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a house. That's rewarding. I love our company. I love what we do. I think it's so much fun. Can you say that about your business? And if not, you need to get your business to a place where you can say that. 
Because if you can't say that, you will never invest the time necessary for it to truly succeed. Because you hate it. And you do not spend time with people you hate. Why self-employment is safer? I have job security. You're the only one doling out pink slips, so I doubt you'll find one in your box. My income is based solely on my own continued efforts and faithfulness to showing up every day. I show up every day in sickness and in health because my livelihood and my family's livelihood depend on it, and I love it. What's worse, working for your own stability or allowing someone else to control it for you? Now, what I, to summarize, as an entrepreneur, I have never been fired. I've never been laid off, and I've never drawn unemployment because I dictate my income, I dictate my hours, I choose when I go, where I go, how I go. Is that what you guys want? Okay. It's going to be a lot of work. Are you ready for it? All right. So entrepreneurship plus discovery plus execution equals failure, right? Yep. Nothing in education and life sets us up to handle failure. It's a natural part of success. Has anybody ever read uh, the big, thick book that Steve Jobs, um, that came out right after Steve Jobs passed away? Did you read that thing? Have you guys ever looked at his story? I mean, Steve Jobs spent more of his adult life broke and on the verge of bankruptcy than he spent wealthy. I mean, when he started Microsoft and sold it off, he had to come back because it was at the verge of bankruptcy. Then he was about to take it into bankruptcy, and then he came out with those uh, orange and blue computers. And from the revenues from those computers, he invested in a little company called Pixar Animation, which made him a multi-gazillionaire. He took the money from that investment, and he made Microsoft bigger. And that's where we got the iPhone and the iPad and the iPod. That all came from that. Oh, Apple. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, we got some uh, Microsoft lovers in here. Okay. Uh, traditional schooling, familiar relationships, personal relationships, on the job training all reinforce our worst feelings and expectations about failure. Why? Because we don't like to fail, do we? What if you could embrace failure? What if failure was like the best possible outcome? How would that be? Would that be helpful? Okay, here's what I'm going to do. On your piece of paper, I want you to write down the following. In my career, write that down. In my career, in my career, I will be broke, bankrupt, and destitute no less than three times. Write it. I'll explain why in a minute. I will be broke, destitute, and bankrupt three times. <laughs> uh, hey, you, you're working on three. No less than three. Let's go, baby. Knocking on the door one. Two? Okay. Now here's why. Okay. If this is like the worst case scenario for you, you've already settled on it. It's, it's okay, right? If that's the worst case scenario, could you guys survive with that worst case scenario? Could you survive? You'd figure it out. Then what are you so worried about, right? I told my wife before we got married, I said, by the way, I'm probably going to go bankrupt several times in our marriage. And she went, that's okay, you're so dreamy. <laughs> Why are you laughing? That's a true story. True story. <laughs> yeah, she can verify. She's watching from home. She can verify. Yeah. Hi, Jacqueline. No, why? Because if that's the worst case scenario, then what's the risk? If that's the worst case scenario, what's the risk? Right? You remove anxiety when you think of that. If that's the worst case scenario.